Welcome to Agile Roots 2010, sponsored by Version 1, Rally Software, Vario, Amirsis, Agile Alliance, and Xmission Internet. Agile Team Performance Management by Arlen Bankstone and Sanjeev Augustine. Okay, hello, uh, Arlen Bankston, uh, Sanjeev, let me call it Light Speed here. Uh, we have Agile Coaching, Consulting, Training Company, uh, Sanjeev and I have worked together about 10 years. Uh, my background, user experience design and uh, Agile Coaching and Development of, of all various sorts. Um, a certified scrum trainer, been out there in, in the industry and had a lot of experience with a lot of different sorts of companies. That's where a lot of this is coming from. So, so that's about me. So, okay. Thanks. Uh, so I'm Sanjeev Augustine. I've been uh, in the industry for more than 20 years, about two decades, so we're going two decades. And I've been uh, playing with this thing called Agile for over a decade. Uh, I got started, uh, as I think Jeff, uh, Jeff Patton was earlier this morning was talking about XP, I think mean, he got started on an XP program on XP t- uh, team. And likewise, so did I. In fact, uh, the first, my first experience with Agile was the fact that uh, in a situation that I was, in, I came, I was coming at, into a company as a product manager, and uh, in this company, um, they were uh, they were asked, you know, they said, well, you know what, we have these three projects going, these like stream programming projects, uh, and have you heard of extreme programming? I said, no, I haven't, but I, you know, I've been able to be learning new stuff, so uh, I've been willing to uh, go out and sort of learn the, uh, what's that, just a little noise. Yeah, you guys?
fair amount of what we're talking about here has been inspired or informed by this. All right. So I want to talk about some of the current issues with performance management. Who here has actually either delivered or been on the receiving end of a performance appraisal? All right. Anyone not? Uh, Put your hands up if you haven't either received or delivered. Oh, cool. You're a lucky guy. Uh, who, who do you work with? Uh, right now, I'm just an independent consultant. Right, but over the over the, the course of several different software. Right, so over the course of a career, I'm sure you know each one of us has encountered a performance of, uh, appraisal, right? They have some sort of 360 degree feedback system. Um, and if you're a manager, put your hand up. If you're a manager, manager, senior manager, director. All right, you guys, uh, if you all sort of the left behind over here with me, uh, with us actually. Okay. Um, if you're a manager, you just put your hand up. Tell me, put your hand up if you really loved delivering the performance of that appraisal. Who, who, put, who really loved it? Okay, so we got, um, and we have to explore that. But you see the numbers kind of thin down when you say, do we have a good performance measurement, and more importantly, a performance management system? Performance management system. We don't have performance appraisals, and we kind of do these things de facto. I think the de facto standard in the industry, standard in the industry, the 360 degree feedback. But the sad truth of it is that our performance management systems are broken, and the reviews are probably one of the worst ways of doing that. People get demoralized, they get demotivated, and a lot of times we end up, as managers, talking more about the things that are wrong with people than where the strengths are. So, you know, there's Marcus Buckingham, you guys, who, who here has heard of Marcus Buckingham, right? First discover all your strengths, or actually, what is it, uh, now, uh, first break all the rules, now discover your strengths. If this is whole sort of thinking that he's been saying, it is much more effective to discover and amplify people's strengths than it is to continuously sort of bug them about their weaknesses. Now, of course, if you have some egregious weaknesses, we should be able to fix those. We have to do it as part of a civilized mem or members of a civilized society, so that we have a productive team. But let's tap into people's actual strengths, and that is much more productive than actually trying to uh, spend more time talking about their weaknesses. Look at that graph over there. However, the performance appraisal process actually leads us in the opposite direction. It leads us to spend much more time talking about people's weaknesses and how to fix them and move them some, to some sort of mean or medium of, um, of uh, you know, sort of uh, performance management. Um, many of these techniques tend to be rooted in what we call management 1.0, you know, Frederick Taylor's industrial age management, not suited for management of knowledge workers. Peter Drucker coined this term knowledge workers, but people will use uh, their minds as much as they use their, their, um, their hands. And um, certainly within software development or any sort of knowledge-based profession, the way we manage knowledge workers has to be quite different from the way we manage industrial workers. So Management 1.0 tends to overemphasize the role of the manager. If you think about the typical review, it involves uh, right, collection of you know, uh, feedback from a whole bunch of folks, uh, the manager collects it and then gives his or her you know, interpretation. There's an interpretation and an overemphasis on the role of the manager. That's one of the issues with this, this whole um, uh, you know, performance appraisal set, uh, set. Let's look at some of the issue, other issues. Traditional reviews bundle three things. Feedback, right? You're supposed to get feedback from a performance appraisal. That's supposed to be the point. How often do we do a performance review? Put your hands up if you are doing annual performance reviews. Put your hands up if you're doing um, six, you know, a performance review every six months. Half year. Okay, you guys are getting better. Anyone doing them once a quarter? All right, you guys are way better. And more frequently than once a quarter, maybe once a month. I got to come and join your company. Uh, tell us which company you're in. Wannabe. Wannabe. That's the name of the company. I certainly want to be with you. Uh, so, uh, no, you know, I, you know, I certainly want to talk with you because uh, there, are, there are very few companies that out here that understand that a performance appraisal is primarily about feedback. And it's actually less about compensation and merit pay. So one of the things we need to do is to figure out how to unbundle these things because they actually tend to traditionally get uh, performance appraisals get done once a year. They bundle the feedback, they bundle the merit pay, and feedback once a year is what? Good, bad. Probably. Really? Right? It's feedback once a year is just too little too late. So that the more frequently we can get feedback, that's the better. And of course, if you want to fire someone, then we got legal cover, and that's sometimes the goal of the performance appraisal. Right? Um, there is some 
sort of, you know, normal distribution that we are usually told that, you know, you, we have, you can only have 10% of people who are doing, uh, exceed expectations, and you can have only another 20% who are meeting expectations. And therefore, once we go through this appraisal process, we have to be able to fit and slot people into this normal distribution, and our hands are tight in that. So there are a bunch of issues over there. Look at, you know, uh, several speakers have quoted Edward Deming, and we certainly don't want to be left out of the game. So we have our own Deming quote over there. And he's, uh, you know, look at his, what he tends to think about uh, annual ratings. Right? Uh, fortunately, we're starting to see a number of trends in the opposite direction. Anyone here, uh, let's say, under the age of 35? Yeah, you guys, 35, you guys qualify as what, Gen Y, Millennium Generation? Uh, you know, I think for the first time in corporate America, we have Gen X in the boardroom, and baby boomers and Gen Y and Gen X together in workforce. So Gen X kind of executives driving workforces that have a mixture of Gen Y, Gen, you know, uh, Gen X and baby boomers. Also, it turns out that the values, not to kind of paint everybody with the same brush, but, but there, tend, there tend to be generational differences in expectations between folks who are in the 35 or under the, the, uh, the Gen Xers, or for people in the 40s like myself, or uh, baby boomers who are, you know, who have been around for a while. And um, we, we start to see that there, there are things like uh, the, uh, the quality of my, the life uh, movement, where people are looking for more meaning as part of their lives. Uh, so my father worked, he was a professor in sociology, and he worked in the university for 25 years. Uh, every day he got up and, you know, actually not quite every day, he didn't teach every day, but he went, he went to work, he came back, he went to work, and he came, and he did that for 25 years. Okay. And he sought meaning a little bit through his teaching profession, but a lot of it through his extracurricular activities outside work. Well, it turns out that in today's workforce, many of us are seeking meaning in our lives that combine what we're doing at work with our personal passions, with our personal ambitions, with our personal motives. And so what you see is that there's a, uh, you know, especially among the, the Gen Y, it turns out that they will more often be driven by personal passion than, you know, the clock, you know punching the clock and, uh, and going from nine to four, you know, looking at work as a nine to five activity, right? Um, so, I want to sort of jump into what we're proposing here today. We're talking about an agile performance management system that will, will start to define an overall management system, not just a measurement system, which is what the performance appraisal is. The performance appraisal is just one way of HR sort of influencing one sort of measurement with a, with a whole lot of disastrous consequences, right? So we're talking about a more holistic look or a more holistic system that really draws everybody, and Andrew used this term, into the circle of happiness. We talk about agile being a circle of happiness. Right now, our circle of happiness is fairly restricted to, or it was, fairly restricted to the numbers, right? Agile grew from, from out of the development community. Therefore, you know, if you're a developer, you're sort of square, bad smack dab in the uh, middle of this, uh, the circle of happiness. If you were a project manager, you're kind of left out of the party. Well, now we're starting to make a remedy that now project management and scrum and all that has been sort of being bring, brought, if not completely into the circle of happiness, at least on the fringe. If you were a product owner, I remember um, Jeff, uh, some years ago, sort of lamenting the, the lack of usability techniques within the agile community. Well, we're certainly remedying that. So we're starting to make, you know, live up to our own promise or live up to our, our own, uh, you know, a premise, if you will, that agile teams are holistic, they're one team, and they integrate all of the disciplines. Well, we, we want to come up with a, we want to propose a uh, performance measurement system that combines intrinsic motivation extrinsic motivation. So intrinsic motivation is about what drives each of each one of us as individuals. How do we find meaning in, in, in our work? What, what excites us? What makes us passionate? Uh, how do we get into the zone, right, into this flow? Uh, there's this guy called uh, Mihai Chiksen. Mihai Chiksen Mihai. Thank you. Hungarian, uh, uh, you know, Hungarian author who talks about flow and passion, how you can get into the zone and really get highly productive, we'll be talking about it a little later. But intrinsic motivation is about that. Each one of us, what is our individual journey? But then, harking back to making sure that it's not all about ourselves, we have to anchor what we're doing and align it with the external system. 
right? Behavior is a function of the person within the system. So therefore, we need an extrinsic motivation that says, here's the line in the sand. These are external outcomes. These are external outcomes. rewards. You know, these are things. What are the results? We can come up with the best you know, kind of system that works for us and helps us to align our passions, but they won't be truly aligned unless we're talking about you know, what are the results we're able to achieve? What have we achieved? How is the market just us? It's ultimately about, about results. We're, it's not about the process. It is, process is simply a means towards an end. And it's about the results that are being, that the ends that we're uh, shooting for. So we're going to be talking about each one of those things. Um, there are some companies actually do, that have fairly evolved cultures. And those cultures are actually rooted in their performance measurement systems, or their performance management systems. You see some examples up there, not that we're calling out one or the other, but these are different strokes for different folks, right? Uh, Google you know, might appeal to us as you know, this whimsical idea factory. People have this 20% time that helps them to work on uh, you know, things outside of uh, work. You guys heard of the, who here has heard of the Google 20% rule? Right? What is the Google 20% rule? 20% your own time. 20% your own time, which means you do what? Spend it. You want not quite whatever you want, something, but something, whatever you want that will ultimately add result back to the company, right? So, um, so you can go off, you know, things like the those holiday, you know, occasionally Google will permit or sort of break from the simplistic rules and they will allow, you know, this holiday theme to come up, right? Halloween with little pictures and all that. Well, apparently there was some guy, you know, wanting to get his spare time playing play around with something and it found its way back into uh, Google's actual product. Uh, Senko, Brazilian company, we you know, again, um, uh, we, our Brazilian example over here is, uh, is this company where everything is extremely democratic, right up to the point that there are two places reserved on the board of, you know, on the board of directors for employees. At any point, employees can walk into a board meeting and uh, sit down, and the two spots reserved so that employees can be participated in the board of directors meeting. Um, different models, Gen GE, quite famously, you know, if you're not performing, and you fall into the uh, that uh, bottom 10%, you will be fine. Now, certainly not a model that we would want to adopt for ourselves, but it, it kind of drives a type of culture and type of behavior. General Electric certainly financial, you know, financial successful and uh, quite unmistakable. You can tell from this culture what kind of company it is. So, um, what, what kind of system do we want to set up? We want, we, we want to set up a system that is much more in alignment with the Agile ethos. And I love, uh, I actually haven't seen the new purpose that uh, Diana put up for the Agile Alliance. You know, it's about you know, the uh, sort of uh, you know, transcendent purpose, if you will. It's about productivity. It's about uh, you know, helping Agile companies be, or companies be more productive, uh, humane, and what is the third one? Sustainable, I think, yeah. Productive, humane, and sustainable. I think that's, those are three goals or principles that we should be shooting for. Um, with the three principles, and so what are some of the goals that we want to set up? Um, first of all, we want to set up a true performance management system, not just a performance appraisal system. Or, um, and we, it, it's got to be encompassing, all encompassing, and encompass all of those roles that we talked about. We want to un unbundle the feedback, compensation, and merit pay. Right? Uh, we talked about those issues over there with, with actually uh, uh, having them bundled and doing the feedback only once at the end of the year. Holistic involvement from team members. Uh, accommodate different, different levels of performance. People perform at different levels and at, you know, at, 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 at different points in the career. You might have the same top performer if you move him or her to a different environment, they might actually not be that, 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 that great. So different people perform at different levels during the careers. We want to recognize that fact. Um, and most importantly, we want to make sure that ours is a, an adaptive system. And what makes it adaptive? We have to be collecting feedback and delivering feedback every step of the way. So we're going to talk about a, a few of these things. I'm going to, I'm going to go, to, uh, go through this slide of intrinsic motivation. Are we doing on time? Okay. Yeah, we're doing um, all right. Um, so uh, when it comes to intrinsic motivation, I'm going to draw on three things. And these are the three things that Dan Pink says we've got to watch out for, look out for. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. When we're striving to motivate people, and we're striving to 
help them find meaning within their jobs and within their lives. Not quite within their lives, so please, you know, at, within their jobs. We need to be looking at these three things, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So let's start with the first one, autonomy. You know, way back in you know, 40, 50 years about the book, Peter Drucker's been dead a couple, a few years at least, uh, but you know, he's the one who first proposed or coined this term, knowledge workers, and he said, we need to manage knowledge workers differently from the way we manage industrial age work. So he, he also said that measuring productivity is actually a pretty difficult thing to do. And he said quality is the optimal, world, uh, optimal path to high productivity. How do we actually get high quality and thereby high productivity? Knowledge workers need to determine their own goals. They need to be involved in the measurement criteria. So this is all about intrinsic motivation. And then here, sort of anchoring back, anchoring it back in extrinsic motivation is that we're saying that knowledge workers must understand what is our business, right? What kind of business results should we do, are we expected to deliver? Who is our customer? Who are our customers? What do they want? How will they pay us? What does the customer consider valuable? It's, these are the extrinsic, you know, the, the stuff at the bottom of the slide are the extrinsic driving factors. And the stuff at the top is how do I link these back to myself and make them my own intrinsic motivation factor. So I can get to autonomy if I have my knowledge workers focus on the top part of the slide. And myself and my other fellow managers can, so can work with knowledge workers to answer the bottom half of the slide. Does that make sense? Any questions there? Um, so Alistair, Alistair, I guess, is another rumor. So Alistair is famous for many things, and one of the things he's famous for is to, uh, for coming up with this uh, taxonomy of, of a learning progression, where people follow this path of Shu Hanwi, a, a beginner or an apprentice level, a journeyman level, and a master level. Every craft, every profession follows some sort of pro progression. We don't all start out as experts. In fact, the path to becoming an expert is actually pretty long and arduous. Anyone here uh, um, read books by Malcolm Gladwell? And, and Tipping Point, uh, what's the other one? Uh, Blink and all that, right? And I think it was in Outliers, uh, Malcolm Gladwell said that you need what in order to become an expert? Anyone remember? 10,000 hours. It turns out that many of the child, so-called child prod prodigies, like Mozart and all that, actually just had an early, slowly start. And they actually worked out to 10,000 hours, which is effectively about, and in our work, work days, we talk about uh, five years of solid, hard work, you know, really practicing and working towards mastery. And if we get, you know, if we sort of understand that there's a progression towards mastery, and then we also understand, and the gentleman at the back, of one of the Lean on you to pronounce this again. Mihaly Csikszent Mihaly? Csikszent Mihaly. Mihaly Csikszent Mihaly. Thank you very much. He, he says, people are most happy when they are in a state of flow. Right? Now, on this journey of mastery, when you're in the zone, when you're working, you're writing some code, or you're designing a, a, a screen, or if you're a manager, and uh, what a manager is, you'll have you. <laughs> Come on, you guys. Uh, coming up with a great system like this. Yeah, all right. So, uh, whatever your different role, your role is, uh, there is how do we achieve that like, that journey, or how do we get onto that journey towards mastery? Because mastery is, a, is in some senses, a journey without a without an end. We have a destination, but we continue to improve, right? So, uh, let's get our, you know, let's understand that we need to we need to tap into people's autonomy. Let's understand that we need to. Uh, a journey towards mastery, and then also let's understand that people are looking for some meaning and purpose in their lives. Right? So it's not just about getting that reward, that little carrot that extrinsically going to motivate me. Uh, here's my reward, I'm going to get 10 bucks if I deliver this line of code, and I'm going to sort of run like a hamster on the way. Well, that's part of it. We need both. But I'm also looking for something, a higher purpose for my life. How can I anchor or hitch my work that I'm doing? something larger than myself. The Agile Alliance is not just about teaching process, it's about coming up with a, a you know, it's a value system or a system of community that, that's driven.
driving productive team members, that's driving you know, uh, sustainable, sustainable in, the, in software development, also that's driving the Jimmy, that's right. So um, autonomy, mastery, and purpose is all part of intrinsic motivation. And um, I want to sort of leave you with this one. I've talked in uh, you know, fairly sort of high level terms of here, but I want to talk about, uh, share this one slide. We have a limited amount of time. But here's an, here's an example of how you might do to take a personal objectives kind of process, a personal uh, performance appraisal process, and rather than just say, you know, deliver line of code, such and such, or you know, uh, let's take some of these, analyze and direct market research. You might want to do something like this. This is called job crafting, where people can look at the jobs they're doing, and in those gray shared areas are their activities. And this one person uh, has basically looked at you know, the, the, the length, the size of these activities represent the time she's spending on them. If they're a little smaller, uh, writing quarterly reports is less than analyzing and directing market research, you see two roles over here. But basically what we're saying is, now let's talk about what this person does at work, actually one who him or her to write themselves. And if you want them to list the activities that they do, the work, job, and responsibilities, start with their passions. What, what are your passions? What are the strengths? What are the motives? If you have a passion for teaching, right? it comes back. It comes back. Wait five seconds. Wait five seconds. Um, if I have a passion for teaching others, I didn't do that. <laughs> Um, if, if I have a passion for teaching others, how can I align that with the work that I'm doing? I have a strength for one-on-one -on -one communication. Now my, my strength can be aligned with my passion for teaching somebody else. Uh, and I, I'm looking for meaningful relationships. Um,
right, are maybe not just developers, but over time, testers have found a way to be included. I came from a user experience background, UX people have found a way to be included. Uh, it's, it's a gradually growing sort of, uh, sort of tent we've got here. And now what we're trying to do is extend it out and say also that we're, we're, we're going to include everyone in some sort of an effective manner. And, and here's where some other things come into play. If you look at basic extrinsic motivations, think of safety. Those of uh, us who have been coaches always hear about this. You need to create an environment of safety for your teams such that they can feel comfortable to learn and experiment and fail and, and fail again and succeed occasionally. And in order to do this, you've got to get paid enough that you can pay your mortgage and, and support your family uh, and, and upgrade your life every year and again when, when, uh, when, when things get a little slow for you. This means that basically you have a base salary that is fair, that is set by the market, that is not uh, greatly below or above uh, those peers of yours. Uh, and, and why does this matter? Because this is the way people are. People are, are relativistic and they compare one another to one another. And that whole keeping up with the Joneses things of, of that the people next door make more money than me, this makes people unhappy. And it's, it's unfortunate that people are that way, but they are. Okay, and so, so we need to take that into account and say, all right, we've got a base salary and it's fair. And I think we, we can agree that's not anything new. But there's also the idea of something above and beyond that. When you do something you're really passionate about, uh, you create a product and you had fun doing it and everything. But then, let's say it succeeds wildly and you get no piece of the pie and somebody else takes all the credit. Does this, does this eat at you a bit? I mean, despite the fact you loved the journey and it was a fun journey, at the end of it, you'd also like to say, well, I created something marvelous and I'd like to share the reports there. And if it doesn't happen, a sense of injustice creeps in. Okay? And, and, and people begin to feel jilted. Uh, and, and that's this, this lack of justice will sink the mightiest of, of efforts. And, and over time, it will make even an intrinsically rewarding system unsustainable. Okay, So what we're saying here is, you need some of the extrinsic rewards in order to be able to, I don't think I think it's a computer, it's, it's a projector, but the, um, that needs to be able to, uh, needs to be able to look at the extrinsic side of things as well. And basically include people in the rewards of, of the efforts that they've been, uh, that they've been working with. So uh, if you look at ways to actually build this into a system, what we're really saying is, You've got, you've got have different sorts of roles, of course, here. And these, uh, you, we've got here a few, uh, few stereotypes. You, you have people who are in a scrum team. What are they trying to do? Create a good product. Help their team members. Be a, a complementary part of a, of a greater team. And, and do things collectively that, that are good for everyone. So that you could say that perhaps, uh, in, in this instance, I've you know, worked with some video game development companies. Well, there's something that is certainly uh, both intrinsically and extrinsically motivating in different ways. Uh, a, a common metric. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Metacritic? Yeah, you've heard of this site. It's a, uh, it's a site that gathers reviews from various outlets for all sorts of things. Video games, movies, and whatnot. Uh, and, and actually, there are a number of game companies out there that uh, often are incented by their publishers to get high scores on Metacritic. Because a lot of people look at that, and, and when reviewers are writing uh, things in the press, it's, uh, it's just something that, that you know, the market looks at and says, you either got your succeeded or you haven't, based upon that score. So that might be one of those extrinsic motivations. Now, you know, as, as you're going towards that, you would say that if they succeeded, they would be able to, to reap the benefits of, of that, basically that product succeeding. So there would be an element of team results. Uh, how do we do as a team to, to basically deliver that product? And there may be some portion of individual results as well, depending on your particular role in the project and what you're able to do. That might come into play. The basic point of this is that none of these are meant to be set in stone, but the individual rewards should be subsumed by the larger ones. And then not that they shouldn't ever exist, because in some cases they make sense, but they should be subsumed within the larger system of uh, helping your team, in fact, to, to do it do good stuff. There's a, up in this invisible blue uh, slide up here, but what we're talking about are some examples, in fact, of, of different sorts of, of metrics that you might find. Uh, that, that would be examples of uh, extrinsically measured, uh, of extrinsic measures. And, and these are mostly real examples from various projects. 
we might say that there's a project out there to try to keep a, uh, you know, a, a website, to be designing a website because people start a process to sign up for your service and they never finish it. We've got a dropout rate of 96% and that sucks. So we want to get better than that. Uh, and that would be, in fact, uh, an extrinsic motivation. And the things that the, how would we get there? The team would suggest ways to get there. Is this the product owner's job? Well, they're there to, to spearhead the vision and to help you know, provide ideas and ways to get there. But it's everybody's job. Okay? But everybody has to say, well, that's our goal. And we're going to play our little part and try to get a little bit closer to that goal as we move forward. But it gives us data to which we can turn and decide if we're improving or not improving as we go forward. So uh, I, I, had a lot, I did a lot of work in it, Lean and Six Sigma and things like this uh, back in the day, actually after I had learned Agile. So when I was learning all of that, I, I was doing it in the context of, in fact, working with that Agile teams. And it led to a lot of this, uh, what we call discovery sessions, these, these uh, project kickoff events, where basically we try to decide what these measures were and have teams share in the description of what those measures were. So that decreased dropout rate would not be something handed down from on high. It would be something where the team would collectively come to the, uh, the realization that that is in fact the overall goal of what they're trying to do and, and would be a good way to demonstrate success in the proper direction. Okay, an, an extrinsic hard data measure and it's one that you would apply a number of different solutions to, but everybody has a part to play in it. And uh, once, we, once we come back to the, the, the light here, what you're going to see is basically that all we're really talking about is a more holistic process. Agile has an air of inclusivity to it in the language, but it, you know, in practice it's not always so inclusive. It, it's inclusive with, within these smaller containers, as Diana put it in that, that slide up there so nicely. Even the team, it's inclusive, but not necessarily inclusive in the broader context. So how can people play a more effective role? Basically, managers can be, can be leaders. They can try, try to set up systems, and uh, again, I'm saying exactly what, the, what Diana was saying previously, set up environments here wherein this sort of a system can actually live, where team members feel safe to own, own their process through, through retrospectives, improving it, and all that, and the product, okay, that, that is, and product owners. They're not just about the product and the results, in fact. Uh, they're also interested in the process because it will help them to realize a, a, a better end product. So then you've got this, uh, an entire inclusive system here which involves uh, basically managers and, and the team. And who are we missing here? The customers and users. Okay, we've again, uh, and, and again, if you look at Jeff, you got into a little detail about what I really mean by this. We're not talking about having one customer representative come and, and you know, throw some advice to teams way or write a user story for you. We're talking about actually having users and customers actively involved and basically that they're telling you what their problems are or you're looking at them even better and figuring it out for yourself. Uh, you being the entire team. Uh, they're not just the product or you're going out there and finding out what's happening and coming back, uh, but in fact the entire team de determining what the issues are and understanding them in, in sort of an internal manner. And difficult to read there, but then this leads to uh, both these intrinsic and extrinsic objectives. Intrinsic, basically, we, we as a team feel like the work we're doing is good. We can't come up with better ideas how to do it. You, if you think about a, a botanical metaphor here for a moment. You might say that the team would go out there, they would select the seeds and they would choose the plant. We think that, given the environment out there, what we understand about our customers and users and the market and the competition, these would be ideas that would probably succeed. Led by a product owner, perhaps, but again, with involvement from the entire team. And they would decide how the process they felt would best achieve that. Like, scrum with a, a dash of XP and some Kanban as a, as a tool set, perhaps. And then, they would go out there, and at the end of each sprint, let's say, if we're doing Scrum, you can go and you show some things to customers and users, you let them use it, you see the feedback that comes back. You look at your extrinsic measure and you say, are the things we're doing working or aren't they? Is, is the product all it needs to be or isn't it? And if it isn't, perhaps we haven't chosen the right things to do. Uh, perhaps our process needs improvement. But again, it brings that into perspective as well. Not just about the process, but about what the product you're building as well. And 
And, and so this is basically a system that it is definitely a whole loop. It, it's happening all of the time from both a process and product perspective. We're building things, we're testing how they work, we're seeing how we did them and if we can do it better, and, and we're moving forward over time. So uh, that's basically the essence of, of, of what we're talking about. Find the intrinsic motivations that matter to people. Find things that they're passionate about. Uh, and uh, take, basically have them understand and, and involve directly customers and users in the entire process. Not in demonstrations and dog and pony shows, but in actually a rolling things out operationally and letting people play with them and, and get some experience and, and you can see what's happening. I'll go back to it because what inspired me to come up with a lot of this and is really just pulling together ideas from different spheres. Nothing, you know, no sparks of brilliance up here that nobody else ever ever came to. But but basically, uh, I, I was I, I talked about video game development. It started there. Because uh, you would go in and you'd say, a, a video game is interesting because it's so much more subjective. And inherently it's much more difficult to say, ah, here's a, 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 an idea for a game and it will work. The fact is you never know what it will work. And if you look at the most successful companies out there, they're ones that have good ideas at the start and then take them and they just, they nurture them and evolve them and pivot them and change them until they're, they're, they're at a diamond sheet. And if they don't, they don't succeed. Okay, it's not a, a game, it's the sort of thing anybody needs to buy. So it's extra important that you build something that people will want to buy. And, and, and we can look at any of our products and there are elements of this in most things that we build. Uh, but, but that's a typically compelling thing. So, you know, for example, a team might say, I want to you know, build something that would be a, uh, you know, a foreboding environment that creates tension in the player and makes them nervous. And we would say, how would we do that? And we wouldn't expect a, a product owner, creative director, game designer to come to us with all the answers. We would involve everyone and say, what do you think could make it work from a, a music perspective? What, what do you think could make it work from a, an animation perspective? Would make it more dark and foreboding? How would we measure foreboding? You know, when we're testing with people, how do we know if it's foreboding? We'd ask the team, you know, come up with ways to measure this. Let's, maybe it's a survey, maybe they're very concrete measures. But if we don't ask the questions, we never know for a break. Okay, so it's not all warm and fuzzy and, and, and abstract. We need to get into something that's measurable, and that's not always easy, but it is usually possible. Okay, so even, even for very abstract things like that, like games. And so, uh, just to sort of sum up the basic idea, there are lots of different things floating out there. We're not going to get into any detail about these right now, although you know, perhaps we can talk about it offline. But this idea that there, there are different levels of feedback and different types of things that happen. Uh, you know, I've sort of talked about this idea of group discovery, and that's what Jeff was talking about this morning as well, of involving everybody in the definition and ideation and iteration of whatever it is we're building, the product. Group feedback on a product. There's this idea of, uh, uh, you know, micro-feedback and things like that, which are mostly meant to be individual, again, process feedback, if you like, about, about performance of an individual. Well, we'll Twitter you do it. You know, Arlen, you're, you're too long windish. You know, I'll take that as a, a note for my next talk and you know, to, to shorten things up a bit. There are these ideas of maturity assessments. This is a sort of an evil, a much uh, diminished thing in, 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 in agile service to many people. They say, oh, but we don't want to be uh, assessed for maturity. But what, what is it used for is a key question. If, if a team says there are elements that we can see in our, our engineering practices or in our product discovery practices where we're more or less mature according to uh, various benchmarks and our own interpretations, then that can help us get better. And as long as we're not uh, measured and then our, our pace suffers because of it or whatnot, then that's a good thing. It's feedback, it helps us improve our process, and that's marvelous. Okay, so lots of different you know, tactics and techniques and tricks about how to go about implementing this. But the basic idea is we need to find the intrinsic motivations that, that actually drive people. And we need to make sure that we uh, are linking these to measurable extrinsic outcomes. Uh, and, and that we're also involving the teams and product managers and everyone else in, in finding and defining those extrinsic measures and the intrinsic People decide how they can best contribute. They come up with their objectives. Uh, teams and product owners decide what's best going to succeed, and they test that. And if it doesn't succeed, they change it. So in an adaptive, inclusive process here, and this I'm not going to 
try to read all that up there, but basically there are lots of problems that you see, real problems. Uh, you know, having to go out and coach and consult, but what you see most often in agile teams that these, these simple ideas and values can help to address of, of being more inclusive. We don't say it's not my job. We don't say we don't stay out of the room manager. You know, we don't say product owner, that's just you. They're, they're, we're, we're all trying to build something quality here. And there are various parts that we need to play in it. And HR needs to be part of the game too. Okay, and, and it's it's one it, it's an, an element that has been long outside of the equation, and it's time for it to come back in. And with that, uh, that's pretty much it. I just wanted to, to sort of round up here and ask questions. Apologize for the other uh, jittery presentation. But it's, uh, yeah, hopefully, fix the next. Yes.